Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, Episode 7. We have got a very special guest today, and I don't want to waste any time. Let's go ahead and try and pull Nick up here on screen, see if we can see him and see if we can hear him. Hello, Nick. Well, hello, Chris. How are you, buddy? All right. I can hear you perfectly. I can see you perfectly. How about how about chat? How is Nick popping up? Can you, can you hear him? Hello, chat. How do I look? How do I sound? It's good to see you all. We've got lots of people showing up. Okay, we're dealing with a couple technical issues. Quick heads up to everybody. We're going to be doing some funky workarounds to make sure that we can see Nick's screen at a nice nice high frame rate. Um, but let's see how everybody's doing here. And also, oh, quick heads up. If you are on YouTube, well, every once in a while, the streaming software crashes when I have a guest. If that happens, I can restart the stream again, no problem. However, YouTube creates a new URL. So if it crashes, then I'll probably put a URL on YouTube for everybody to go move over to Twitch if need be. But hopefully that doesn't happen. We've had good luck so far, so we'll see if it holds out. Okay, um, quick heads up. I don't know, Nick, do you have the links to the chat? If you ever want to be interacting with the chat when everybody else is doing their thing, I'll send you some links to those directly. So you yeah, send me, send me a link. I'm on, the, I'm on YouTube uh, looking here. Hello, YouTube chat. Good to see you. But if there's a better one, Yo, send yeah. it. Oh, so I we got it. Twitch and YouTube at the same time. Got the pop apps going. We got lots of people coming in. We got Dean and Mr. Matt Dog, Crossfader, Sphere Factory. Crossfader, Dean. good to see you. Rachel, thanks for coming. Oh, there's Rachel here. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Zach, Sean, Electron, Sean. Animation Hamster, Voked. We got lots of people coming in. How is everybody doing? Um, okay, we're going to have lots of time for questions, and we can just do general questions. We're, of course, going to do Cinema 4D questions. I'm going to have some Octane questions for Nick, because I know Grayscale Gorilla has been going in an Octane direction recently, which is super interesting. Ooh, fun. What are you running on these days, Chris? Uh, I am uh, all Redshift right now, just because it's kind of the most vanilla cinema at this point. So that's kind of where I've settled in. But I'm not locked in on that for any like stylistic purpose. It's just the one I think most people are going to have. But I'd love to hear uh, what what's attracting you guys to Octane these days. But we'll get there. So yeah, any yeah, questions? Bet. Everybody, start getting those together. Um, hey, am I green? What's what? Am I is my light? Uh, I need to yell at my light lighting director here. What's am I green? Oh, you look normal to me. You got a nice kind of purple <laughs> tint on one side. And, uh... Okay, I'll, I'll blame this one on Skype. <laughs> yeah, you look normal on me on uh, okay, my good. side. Good. Um, but, I mean, I guess it, it, it's a little weird to do, but why don't we do a quick uh, overview of who you are, what you do, what you're up to these days. Uh, if you have any website stuff you want to pop up, I can switch over to the screen. Just tell me if you're doing that, And uh, but we won't be able to hear anything. Um, but, yeah, uh, what's going on with you, Nick? Uh, yeah, man. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I've uh, been meaning to do this, so I'm glad we finally got this schedule. I'm glad I'm on the show, man. It's really cool. Okay. Uh, I'm Nick Campbell. I'm the founder of Grayscale Gorilla. We make tools for Cinema 4D artists, plugins, uh, HDRIs, materials, a bunch of training to help uh, Cinema 4D artists. Uh, and in fact, if you are a fan of uh, this guy here, Chris, <laughs> not only do we have a ton of great stuff from Chris from back in the day, um, that you can come check out as well on YouTube. And we're actually moving a lot of stuff over from the Vimeo days to YouTube, so uh, so keep an eye out. I think actually one of your last one of the last ones we did, Chris, was from from one of your uh, what was that one called? The topography one we just launched. So Ooh. definitely check that out if you're interested in learning Cinema 4D. Uh, we got a ton of great stuff to help you out. And then if you do. Uh, work in Cinema 4D for a living. We create tools to help you do it faster and make it more beautiful. So check it out if you're not familiar. GrayscaleGorilla.com, the longest URL ever made. Uh, you know, wish it was a little bit shorter, but uh, if you just type in Cinema 4D tutorials, we should pop up there for you. Yep, Rachel, see, I am a, a tinge green. I knew it. That's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to look at it on the stream. I mean, you look the same as I do. Uh, there's a couple people saying you, your mic isn't sounding amazing. Um, uh -huh. You sound pretty good on my end. Um, and what I'm hearing should just be what's running through Restream. Uh, is, too uh, hot, too, too, uh, too cold. I hate bad audio, guys. I, I Let me know. I'll try to fix it. Um, I just moved the mic away a little bit because I'm excited. I'm talking loud. But let me know. And uh, I could I could tweak it. But if it sounds good on your end, Chris. Yeah. I look, as long good. as it sounds good on your end, you know that's yeah, really that what's getting captured. 
Um, but anyway, everybody start getting those questions together. We're going to be just riffing. This is going to be old school. We'll tackle different things. Maybe I can build some sort of rig and then Nick can go and make it look pretty with some lighting and some materials. There's a bunch of cool new uh, materials out from Grayscale Gorilla. Uh, I think you got a bunch of new car paints out like this week, right? Yeah, it just came out yesterday. So um, uh, I guess I kind of flew past exactly what we have over there. But Right now, we, we have the ability for you to get everything we have uh, under an umbrella we call Grayscale Gorilla Plus. So it's a membership, and you get all of our plugins, all of our uh, materials, all of our HDRIs, and all of the pro training for one price a month or per year. And we're constantly adding new stuff to it. And yesterday was one of our biggest additions yet. So we have a brand new material collection. Uh, might be able to uh, show you later in the stream if we end up doing something like that, where I could show you some materials. Um, an amazing new car paint um, uh, collection. If you guys do car paints, or even if you don't do cars and automotive uh, specifically, if you guys do any uh, like really textural paint jobs, things like guitars, um, uh, you know, like uh, motorcycle helmets and other things that have that kind of shiny, uh, glossy flakiness to it, these car paints are frankly the best car paints made for Cinema 4D artists. You gotta go see them in action. And if you're a Plus member, they're in your library right now. You just click and download and start using them in all of your projects. So we released that, some HDRIs, bunch of new stuff, but we can get into that later. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it, I'm just I'm excited to have it out. It's uh, really it's really been a big journey to get Plus to where it is. So I'm just I'm glad it's it, it's uh, available to everybody now. Yes, yes, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna go over the rules really quick for everybody if you're gonna be posting questions. First of all, you can only post links on Twitch, not on YouTube, but feel free to type out questions on YouTube, even Cinema 4D questions. Those are some of my, my favorites, so no problem there. If we don't get to your question, I don't even click the link, feel free to post it again. Just don't go spamming it. If we're wrapping up one question, go ahead and post it again. If you are posting a link to somebody's Instagram or a video, make sure that I can see the artist or studio who made it. If we can't give credit, we're not gonna tackle it. Otherwise, it has to be really abstracted as a question. Um, if it's a video, make sure you call out the specific time code and no links to anything that's being actively sold as an NFT because we are not we are not here to sell people's NFTs. Besides that, uh, everything should go. Typed out questions are fine. If you have any just general like motion graphics questions or oh, I like I like that with Chris. They're like, hey, how would you make this? And then it's their NFT. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not sure, but I think one of those might have snuck in early on, and, and I, mean, I read the description later. Pretty sneaky. I like it. I mean, yeah. don't, don't do it. But I, I see what you're doing. I see what's going on. What yeah. a world, man. Chris, when you when you dropping your NFTs, man? What's when when uh, the people want to know? I, I have had people bugging me. I I, I don't want to speak too much to any of it, but I am I am not terribly excited about the entire NFT space. There's there are definitely good things, but there's a lot of big question marks that I am. I don't know. There's a, a lot of hype. I'm always very skeptical of a lot of hype. I'd rather be, you know, slow and steady instead of jumping on the train. So that's, hey, you uh, were, that's you fine. were, I think you were right about the VR stuff. So I'm going to, I think you're on, you might be on to something, you know? Yeah. You, hey, I don't doubt a bunch of people aren't going to make a bunch of money, but I don't know. Uh, I don't want to get into it. Maybe there's a whole conversation to be had about that one day, but yeah, um, I, agree. I agree. It's an interesting space, but now is not the time, my friends. I am I, excited. I, however, Chris, to answer questions with you. Also, um, to make something with you, man, I, I, I love seeing how you, uh, you know, use Cinema 4D in such new and unique ways. And then, of course, I love grabbing it and trying to, you know, make it look pretty. I, I, it's one of my favorite things. So I'm excited to do this today, buddy. Yes, me too. And we do have questions starting to come in. So I'm going to begin to click on those. I'm seeing if there's any, like, just talking questions. So it's kind of doing a warm up. But for the most part, not so much. But we do have links coming in. Yes, everybody yeah, have, excited have to, to have both of us. Any questions? Um, Cinema 4D, Grayscale Gorilla, my haircut, whatever. Yeah, exactly. But in any case, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, hardware quit. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. Okay, we are going to go and tech. And other people said your audio is sounding good, so I think we're good. Uh, I'm just going to start clicking links. Nick should be able to see some details from my screen, so hopefully that works. Pop this open. Mute the tab because... If I don't mute the tab, YouTube does copyright claims. Let's see what we've got here. This is, okay, well, we've got a, what do you even call this type of matrix? Or this type I, of like dot display? How do I see your display? screen, Chris? 
Oh, I only um, see, I only see us two on the Skype. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, that's because I forgot to click over to my screen. Oh, good. I, I'm just, I'm glad it wasn't me. Cause... There we go. Yep. I, I, nobody could see it. So there we go. <laughs> okay, dude. I love it, Chris. What? I'm sorry. What were you asking? Go ahead. I was asking, I what, what do you even call this type of dot display? Oh, I would say I would call it a dot matrix display. It's popular in pinball machines. So I'm real familiar with the dot matrix here. Yeah, actually, um, it does look like pinball buttons almost the way the, uh, the details oh, are popping out. Oh, when you do the zoom in. Oh, yeah, it kind of looks like arcade buttons when you zoom in. Yeah. Um, uh, this is from 2D Pete from Switzerland. And, yeah, looking pretty cool. Ta on the technical basis, there's a lot of different ways. You could make this look a million different ways. But as far as it actually displaying this text, I think we could probably tackle something like this. Yeah, this wouldn't be too crazy. Um, the... Uh, is this something you want to dive into, Chris, or you wanted to just kind of talk about how we would approach it in general? You, is this something we, we just get in, get in, get dirty, or uh, what do you think? Mm, Maybe get a few think. more and we could decide. Yeah, let's, let's click a couple links and then decide which one we want to tackle. But it's it's a really cool technique, and we can take a look at that. But Yeah, let, we, let's talk about this one no matter what. But let's get a few of them up maybe, and we, we can pick one. I like the sound of that. I'll leave it up to you, man. Uh, let's see. What do we got from Mutter here? Or is that the same one? Nope, that's the same link again. Uh, okay, how would we replicate this in Cinema 4D? Take a look. Mute the tab. Oh, okay, this is, can get crazy. <laughs> this is always dangerous because it's an Entagma link, and they always do incredible uh -oh. things. Um, <laughs> they, got a, this is... they got software that starts with H on their computer. <laughs> yes, but this is actually Blender, which is oh. extra interesting. Um, so it, it's kind of valid as a question. I, I won't answer questions if it's somebody else's tutorial, um, but this is Blender, so it wouldn't be specifically cinema. And I'm assuming I muted the tab, but hopefully that is mute. So we can't play too much of it because then copyright claims might come through. But I'm assuming you're just talking about this blob. So let me just uh, mouse cool. through uh, what everyone's want. Yeah, it just seems to be the overall blob, so we can probably judge it just from this beginning part. So, um, so yeah, in Tagma, obviously, they do crazy advanced things. Their stuff always looks amazing. Yeah, I, great stuff. Great guys, I too. I feel like half the time I get questions about, like, yarn and, like, string dynamics are because of things, you know, they're all an offshoot of things that they had made at different points. But yeah, this kind of cool, weird blobby thing is a, a viable thing, very abstract. So it gives you a lot of possibilities to tackle, but I definitely think we should take a couple more questions and see which one is jumping out at us most. There's some possibilities here, a little volume, a little fields, maybe be a little be interesting. I like yeah. that one. Where are the, uh, are these links coming through the, uh, the U the studio.youtube? Or is it this directly is, these on are a different Twitch. chat? This is the Twitch chat coming through. Oh, right? cool. I sent you a link to that one as well. I gotcha. Oh, I see. It's two. New cool. Tab. Thanks, man. Okay, here's another one. And you guys know in, this, in the chat that usually I tackle almost everything with, by myself. But when I have a guest, I want to make sure that we tackle something that's going to utilize everybody's talents. So let's just be extra picky and find something cool. Okay, we got something from Tavo Studio. And this is a still, but they have several stills. Oh, it's kind of this cool... Melty, drippy, upward chocolate. Ooh, I kind of like this. This is neat. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, Chris, but I, I, those upward drips are where I got your name on them, dude. <laughs> That's true. It's, do you know what's making me think of? The old the goo goo, rock? The goo rock tutorial. Goo rock, Chris. Dude, the it's classic. a classic, man. I remember how long you and I sat around. I was like, here's the tutorial I made. What do we call it? And like, it's just this. It's this Gooey Rock Tutorial, but that's a terrible <laughs> name. Goo Rock Tutorial, and an hour later, like, I guess it's Goo Rock. It's it's an <laughs> awful name. I I I think even Rachel's like, what what is this thing? What Goo Rock? Yeah. It, it is what it is, though. It's a goo, gooey rock. Um, it's this, how to make this rocks. Looks it's how to cool make too. goo. Uh, yeah, this one's pretty cool. I mean, there's no motion here, but that almost gives us the freedom to sort of create it the way we want to. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards this one just for some opportunities to do various. There's a bunch of different things we might be able to do with that. Yeah, <laughs> Dean I, is saying I, he spent hours on the goo rock. <laughs> <laughs> so did we? Too. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. It, I'm glad it's helpful. I was like three. That was like a three-hour tutorial split up. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Oh, I just clicked over in the Twitch chat by the way before we get started in cinema and seeing some familiar faces. Good to see you guys. Uh, Winbush. Good to see you, man. Pro Tools oh, 3000. Dude, classic. 
been around. Love yes. it. Good to see that name. Good to see that name. Uh, Keyframe. What's up, guys? Brother Sorry. Zach, I was... Yeah, we got tons of people. Thanks, everybody, for coming and hanging out. I'm excited. Um, so uh, if we like the look of this one, and I, we already have a couple links, so I think uh, of the three, this one, I think, gives us some pretty neat opportunities. And I think just for whatever material you might decide, what you know, what type of uh, goo this might be, you have a lot of options maybe to show us some Octane stuff. Uh, yeah, actually, I, it might play right into everything we got going. I think it'll be nice to light up and talk about some different lighting options with this thing. Uh, and of course, materials. Um, and just selfishly, I'd like to see how Chris tackles goo in a world that has volumes in it now, because I don't think that was around. Not that you needed to use volumes, but um, gosh, that tutorial is so old now. It'd be nice to see how Chris tackles a little bit of goopy goo. In yes. the new world, in the new Cinema 4D world. I'm, I'm interested too, man. Yeah, this is my vote. Yeah, oh, I like it. Let's do it. So once again, Tavo Studio put this together. I know we've gotten links to their work before. They do really good stuff, so make sure you go and give them a follow. Um, oh, uh, Ehab is saying that Gurok showed showed him the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, oh, and I'm also seeing, we, we said that we'd um, mention how we thought that LED thing was done, even if we don't tackle it. Oh, yeah. Um, you the first. I think we could even just talk about it, Chris. I think yeah, you could s set up those. Uh, just let's just call them spheres for a moment, because they could eventually be whatever model you want. But let's say you just populated a bunch of objects uh, in that grid, and then I think you could use. I think you use real type if you found the right typeface, and you might even look up dot matrix LED display typeface. Find something that has that thinness, that that kind of mono thickness to everything, and then literally run that type along the 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 dots and use that type as like an effector essentially to turn on and off the brightness. I think you I mean, could. Uh, we can actually dissect this a little bit extra if we want to start getting really picky. I mean, this is a really cool look, but if mm -hmm. you want to get really specific, when these are in real screens, when the text is moving across. You're going to get that exact same look, but offset like pixel by pixel as it moves across the screen. But here, in certain shots, you can actually see, like if you look at this Y, like sometimes some of them are being partially lit and other times slightly not, where I think you can actually see that text passing through. Moving. So yeah, it's, that, it's essentially you know, the, the voxel look of it is slightly jumping between them. Yeah, it's a good point. When you do it on a real dot matrix, it's going to jump exactly to the next set of pixels and what we're seeing now is something that really it doesn't it doesn't actually do in, in a in a typical dot matrix screen which is give you all this gray and kind of jitteriness and i think you're right that y shows it the best maybe the u too where it kind of gets too thick there for a while well let's, i mean here let's do the 30 second version so just a matrix object create yep. a text object we won't even change the text just Love lay it. it down on the ground t for scale move it over and I believe if we go into the matrix, give it a plane effector. I don't want to affect the position, but I would like there to be a fall off based on the text. Tell the text to be not a curve, but be a mask. And I want the mask to be coming down from Y. So along Y, and now you can see the text is getting projected in from here. And you can see there's a little bit of a transition. So inside of the plane effector, you can see there's a distance fall off, and we can cramp, we can clamp this all the way down, and now it's just on or off. Oh yeah, that that'll solve that ghosting effect. Uh, yeah, the ghosting, but then it also just goes to the difference. Kind of what I was talking about was th this E. Well, actually, I would love to even change. Let's lower the resolution. Actually, I lower the resolution just by shrinking this down. So you can see how this X is built like two pixels on top. Like two, it's like two offset two two. But if I start slowly scooting this text, you see how like kind of the way that it's formed is a little different. It's like now it's two layers of two on the top. So that's that's a slightly more difficult thing to perhaps tackle. But you know now we've got this pixelated look as long as you move nice and slow. And this matrix doesn't have to be a matrix. It could be any model. Make it some spheres. Make it some buttons. Anything that lights up. Some LEDs. So yeah, that's the super duper quick version of that. Yeah, one two skip if you and then you're done. And and really the only, the the trick for me is always remembering how to pipe in the different color language into the third party renderer. You know, like mm. now that you 
now that you have this isolated, it's really just about remembering the the like octane node or redshift node that takes that color value, and then you just pipe it into whatever you want in a material. And in this, in the case of the renderer uh, that we saw, it's like in a, some luminant material that you then control using this green channel. Um, I, I, if I were to say it in a in a quick way, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, cool. Now, even even on this, my, my like my brain is already going crazy of like ways to make it so that your pixels don't sort of wander. And I, I wonder if we could, I'm not going to do it, but you could probably take this matrix object and instead of colorizing them, scale them down to nothing. And then cinema doesn't acknowledge once they're scale zero. And then you would literally just have those blocks. And then instead of using, then you take those blocks and offset them on say a different matrix object. And now they would only appear if they were directly in oh, range. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that could actually yeah, use give two, you the use one, one to trigger the other. Yeah. So yeah. layer those up. That could be cool. Yeah. So, um, do do a search to um, if if you try this at home for like a pixel pixel font something that has that built right in, like an LED uh, like a clock radio type of display. Alphanumeric might be a good search term. Um, you might find the the typeface that'll actually just make this a little easier. Cool, good. I didn't mean to take you off course of the goop. I mean I'm super excited of the goop. Yeah. Uh, but I uh, just want to make sure we answered that one. Yeah, I, that's good to do that while we're still back at that early step. So uh, can you think of anything else before trying to dive in on the rig? Actually, why don't we talk for a second about what we want to drip? Because this was, it seems to be wrapping up some sort of fancy dessert. But if we're just looking at the chocolate, I mean, not even chocolate, but the, the melting goop that's going to be traveling upward, we could have this traveling off of some text. We could just do a sphere. We can go old school and make a nice sphere. The people are requesting spheres in the uh, chat, which is why I say that. I mean, you know me. <laughs> You know me, I, I love that. I wonder, Chris, what might look cool is, so imagine the sphere that's like half melted up. So it's almost like the bottom half of a sphere, like a little, uh, like a half of a snow globe. And oh, then, then the top is still a little goopy. And then it's almost like that's the transition. It's like slowly disappearing as the sphere is melting into the, to the, uh, into the sky. Yeah, so, totally. Maybe we could give that a go. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm going to jump into cinema and start talking about this. Now, even based on what Nick just said, if we were going to have a, let's say we have a sphere and half of it is melting in the sky, we have several different ways to think about this. And one would be, are we building a rig to do everything or are we building a rig to just, just do one particular shot? Because here's why I bring that up. Let's say that we threw that into a bool and I'm going to throw in a cube as well. And now let's A subtract B always. So if I were to move this up, I think this is what you're talking about. We can have half a sphere and then the goop can be coming off of that. So we could be like, okay, that's the starting state and we're just going to have drips come off of that. And we're really only expecting to see like five, 10 drips go upward would be one rig. An alternative rig would be, what if the entire thing is melting upward slowly and then you would build a completely different rig where you have the entire sphere and each piece slowly moves away. And either of those are valid to do. Um, is there any, way, any reason to do one or the other? I mean, I like the idea of getting to the step. And if we are, if you're trying to art direct something, and th this is a really important question. Actually, Nick, this is something I miss when you and I would do the regular streams is because we'd have these discussions about like, wait, should we approach it this way or this way? What's the intent behind it? I tend to just dive right now into like the technical side, be like, oh, let's make something. But, but it, it is important to talk about because, you know, this is what you do in production, right? So we have a limited amount of time if this was a client coming to us. And, you know, that's that's always how I try to approach these things. This stuff's really fun. But at the end of the day, a lot of us do this for a living. And we got clients asking us to do stuff, right? And we go, yeah, we could do it or not. So in this case, they're coming to us with that brief. Let's say they're like, look, it's a ball of chocolate. And it slowly is melting, but it's not melting down, it's melting up. And as it melts, it, it um, kind of uh, dissipates into the air. And then we do this really beautiful close-up halfway through that's like, you know, halfway through we zoom way in and we see all the little details. And then we let's say we zoom back out to the final piece and the last little bit uh, dissolves and then the logo shows. Okay, so that's a really simple like client brief. And Chris said it exactly, which is, what part of the rig are we trying to build? Because there are two pieces to this rig. There's the one 
that is showing it starting like a, a perfectly spherical piece of chocolate with like maybe one drip or one or two little ones just starting. You can imagine, you know, that's starting this beautiful motion. And then we can kind of quickly get to the to the hero shot, which is what I think we, we should tackle, Chris, which is more of this halfway through shot where we zoom in and that's a separate rig because we want more control over this beautiful hero in the middle. Maybe there's like other stuff in the middle of this chocolate. Maybe it's one of those European chocolates with toys in it. Who knows? Yeah. There's something else in the middle we need to spend more time on. So we're going to build a separate rig for that and leave the fully melted rig in another scene file completely because it's going to give us more control for both shots. Um, did I get the gist of that, Chris? 100%. Cool. So I'm. Uh, what do you think, man? I, it, you you want to you want to tackle the like beautiful middle shot, and see if see if we could get there. And then if we get and then if we have time or there's not other questions, we can talk about how we could approach the, the the other rig. Yeah, I think yeah. Let's definitely focus in on the middle one. Essentially, that's what got us excited was the idea of the drips going upward. And if we're worried about the overall sphere, then we're not focused as much on the drips. Love it. That's my thought. So let's see. Uh, there's a million ways of tackling this. Uh, my thought is, why don't we create half of a sphere there? If we want to be really precise, which isn't a bad idea, we can take this cube that's exactly 200, move it 100 up, so we're chopping that exactly in half. Although now I'm seeing this tiny bool er error, <clears throat> error where these two lines just happen to be lining up. So I guess even along those lines, we'll just tick that down just a tiny little bit. Not surprising, just perfect alignment on the bool. That's to be expected. And then I'll make a helix shape with a start radius of 100, an end radius of zero, and a height of zero. And that will give us this spiral. And that is just going to give us a nice controllable way of kind of controlled but randomly placing some drips. And I wonder if we can get away with, honestly, just using a matrix object here, setting that to object mode, dropping in the helix and now i can create exactly however many i want here's a count if we wanted to randomly offset them we could but in general this is going to give us some pretty nice spacing if we're inclined to if we want more we can increase the spiral so they'll travel around additional space and increase the count until we get once again something pretty nicely evenly spaced so actually that's looking pretty nice to me so uh, I, i'm going to try and build this in a the simplest but most controllable way we can so we'll keep this clean, name this drips, and turn off caps lock will help. Drips, and then uh, we want these to slowly and individually travel up into the air. That's going to be straight up into the air, so a plane effector seems appropriate. I would like these to be moving upward. Am I upside down right now? I was spinning my camera a bunch. No, that's correct, why are those traveling down? Oh, the helix must have spun them in a direction. Um, I can fix that easily just by going into the matrix and saying, hey, don't align the clone. And now you see they actually travel upward. So about what's the furthest that they might go? Actually, they might end up going quite far because as the individual drips travel, we're going to want others to go further. But let's say at the height of a drip, we'd want to go, I don't know, maybe about there. So that's just pushing straight in the air. We can increase that or decrease it. But for now... How about adding in a, well, let's say a linear field. Yeah, I think linear field's a good idea. And this is just going to make it so we're multiplying everything so they'll all travel up this way. An important thing to note, of course, is this is going to enable us to pinch this as tight as we want to or as slowly as we want to, but this is just controlling the transition. And right now, as the rig is built in general, they're, well, 100%, they're gonna be traveling from the left, but of course we don't stop there because we shall add a random field. By default, this is going to be, actually it's set to noise, but I think this can be set to straight up random. So everything's being given its own value. Set that to multiply. And now they will travel up in general from one direction on one side to the other, but still based on this linear fall off. And you see them each doing their own individual thing a little bit more, but there's a lot of ways to offset that. Um, additionally, I don't want any color. I'll turn that off. Um, let me think, what's the way I want to do this most? Cause there's so many approaches, even just to getting this to transition. We could be animating a noise on, we could be doing this fall off slowly and actually here's an important thing if i spread this out really wide they'll all travel pretty uniformly and you'll they'll kind of get a drift of all of them but if we pinch this really tight then in general we're still going to get that fall off that we saw um, i don't I, mind that chris tr try the um 
if this was the full shot, you know, if we're if we're describing that original brief where we kind of like start the animation, then we zoom in at like this area, this part of it where it's mm -hmm. like the most beautiful part. I would say animate it wa with that wide gradient and don't have it ever start. In other yeah, words, uh, we're already in. You're already in the animation and it starts kind of like, yeah, like uh, we're like there and it ends there. You know, like actually, even you just saying that just made me think of doing the rig completely differently. Um, because what I was going to do is, and we could do this super quickly, which is creating a tracer object so that we could be tracing these. So hitting play, and should probably get because mm, you need the frames. tracer from the yeah. beginning. We would need the tracer from the beginning, so we'd have to travel up from zero, or we wouldn't get the trail. But based on what you just said, what if we? Mm, well, I want to inter. Actually, no, no, I think about which it. No, which is that? okay too, Chris, because. We don't have to render the whole thing, you know. Like you can, you can start it fresh to just to get the tracer. But then when we get really to the end of it, we'll just focus. We'll just maybe bake it and focus in on the kind of middle part of that animation. Sure. Um, there's there's so many ideas already for different ways we could do this. But here's the new one that pops in my head. What if we make another helix? And I'm just using this to get a straight line. So zero zero zero. And now it's 200 tall. That's completely fine. And that is what I would like to clone around the entire shape. So create a cloner. Drop that in. Clone this as an object and drag in the same helix. That's already set to count. We'll just increase that and turn off the align. So now we got a bunch of lines traveling upward. The difference now being is let's modify these via scale. So let's say that, yes, actually, this drips aren't even necessary anymore because we, know, we want this line. So... The effector will again be the plane, but this time instead of affecting position, oop, that's the plane, thank you. Instead of affecting position, let's affect the scale. I'll say oh, uniform cool. absolute, but we'll just start to scale this down. And if we say minus one, it'll scale them potentially all the way down to zero. But now these lines exist and the same fall off can be used to drag this and have them travel. But you see now we've already got existing lines traveling upward. And some of them, I, I'd like them all to get randomized, but we do have some already in process. But I don't know, depending on our POV, um, I guess we're overlaying. I'm trying to think. Oh, oh, Wait, we got to remember like that a, we're some invert somewhere. Yeah, it is inverted because we're scaling down. This plane is saying, hey, scale these down to like nothing. I, I, I guess maybe a cleaner way to do this is say, hey, let's give it a really tiny height of one. And now the plane won't be doing this inversion. Instead, we'll say, hey, you can scale up to 200. So now it's properly applying. So that that conceptually gets rid of the inversion. So yeah, so they'll all travel upward. But now we don't have to start with them being pre-rolled in a bunch of like negative keyframes. We can just say, hey, we're starting yeah. right there. And then it's ready to go. Dig it. Um, excellent. And then let's bring those drips back. I don't need the effector. But what we can do is say, hey, clone not onto the helix, but let's clone onto our other cloner. Let's see if it acknowledges it properly. Um, oh, it's taking on. Oh, that's interesting. It's taking on. Okay, it's taking on the scale, and they're currently scaled up to 200%. We can get around that by saying, hey, calm down. You go into a connect object. And then the drips aren't cloning onto this thing that's got all this clone information. It's just cloning onto a spline. So we drag that in. And hopefully, uh, the connect, turn off weld, very important. It's going to delete a bunch of them if we don't. And is it doing that old thing? You re do you remember this, this problem, Nick, where the, it's not creating the, it's not create. we're not seeing it because it's not acknowledging this as a spline. So we can trick it into being a spline by putting that into a spline mask. And now it's like, oh, it is a spline. That's oh, still one of the weirdest things to me because we didn't change what we're feeding in, but somehow making a new spline mask parent has tricked this and being like, oh, I'm actually a spline. Um, but anyway, <laughs> let's make a count of one. It's currently per segment. And if I say don't loop, but push all the way, let's start at the end. Now, these are now cloned exactly in the end of those splines, meaning oh. our rig is set up. And let's have this travel in order, which is... Yeah, that starts, it gets modified, and then it drips, so it's already in order. So yeah, as this drags along, then our individual dots should move up. And even at this most basic of states here, I think we're kind of ready to 
um, start feeding this into some volumes and see if we can get some volume. Um, one thing I think it's, well, I'm going to shrink this helix down just a little bit because I don't think it should go all the way to the edge. So just yep. shrink that in a, a hair. But you see why I made that helix. Look how easy it is to change where these are being placed. But create the volume builder. I always immediately put into a volume mesher, holding down alt to become. Oh, hey, Chris, it's been, a, it's been a long time, man, but I got to remind you. Don't Oop. forget to save. Ha ha. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> Especially, uh, I mean, I got pretty good luck with volumes, but I'm just thinking, you know, that's in a good, sp it's a good, sp it's never yeah. not in a good spot to save, you know? Volume, uh, negative gravity. Um, <laughs> yes, very good idea to save. Essentially, you should save as soon as you'd be upset if you crashed and lost that amount of work. So very, very good call. Uh, good time to mention that if you are following, if you support on Patreon, then you get access to these scene files. But in any case, here's our volume builder. It's inside a volume mesher. I would like it to be seeing these splines. Uh, let's drag in the spline mask, see if it sees that. Yes, it does. So we'll use a spline mask. Jumping inside, we can already tell we're going to want more resolution from this. So let's drop our voxels to three. Which, okay, you can see a lot more resolution. That might be acceptable. We might change it as well. I would like the spline to be acknowledged as a density of one. And then you see it smooths that out overall. Here's the oh, overall that's, that's radius. cute already. I love it. Oh, yeah. It's like these cute little uh, diglets. Like little, little Pokemon. Um, so now I put the radius down to five because this is just supposed to be the you know connecting drip. Then uh, let's drop the sphere in next. We'll drag that. And now this you know, instantly that gets blobbed in. Uh, we're probably going to add some variation up on the top, but let's not worry about that quite yet. And lastly, the drips themselves. Drop that in. And I think that these, yes, these can, these will get acknowledged as individual drips. But here's the reason why I did this first. I'm going to save again. I wanted to see if the volume will acknowledge the scale of these. And it does say use particle size, so I'm hopeful. So with the drips selected i will create a random and drop it in the drips and i want it to affect the scale uniformly and it will say positive and negative is that applying no i didn't have it selected when i created it Doop. okay so now it is being applied turn this off so that did not visually change the scale yet but inside the volume builder if we turn on use particle size, yes, awesome, totally worked. Um, so now you can see that That's we awesome. can randomize the scale if we turn that on. I didn't know if it would work, but it did, very nice. So we can control these drips. I don't want quite so much randomness, just a little bit. And potentially, um, and it could be a good idea that instead of using this just purely random scale, we could have tied it into that same other fall off. So the further up they are, maybe the bigger the drip is, or maybe the smaller the drip is. Do you have a thought or preference on that, Nick? Like, should we just leave it random? I would, random or I would say, yeah, I would say two things. Make it a little bit more teardroppy if possible. Oh, definitely. Like, That's nice. Like, step. taller. And then, um, as far as randomness, I, I don't know my liquid physics good enough, but I'm thinking just, like, random would be fine. I feel like, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's, like, tied to the length. I almost want to go look at the reference and kind of see, but... Yeah, um, uh, they're somewhat uniform. They actually no. Yeah, see, well, I guess it makes sense. The more they stretch, ones. but the more yes, they right. well, yeah. But I guess it's pretty random. You see, there's some fat ones, but you get a skinny up top, and as something stretches, you would expect it to get skinnier. But you can also see there's some skinny ones down there as well in the reference. You know what so. I think? So you know what I think? Um, sorry, Chris. I, I feel like it's easier to talk over you when I'm not in the same room. <laughs> I, to cut you off there. Sorry, buddy. Um, I feel. Um, I feel like if you imagine a drip forming and then all of a sudden the actual drip falls off the end, then it's kind of skinny for a while. That until the the rest of the liquid kind of condenses. So I think yeah. the random and some of them super small might be the right way to go. Yeah, let's do it. If you if you get that little like kind of teardroppy tallness to it, I think it I think it'd be good. Now here is the magical step that everybody's waiting for, and that is using the smoothing deformer, which I absolutely love. Drop this in, and that is what's going to actually start making this look cool and drippy. So, oh, look at that. Yes. So nice. That's everything yes. we want it to be. Now, um, because of the way we built the rig, I think it's just a good idea if nothing is quite close enough to bump into the neighbor, but that's as simple as 
grabbing the original clone and changing the count uh, and just either finding a, a random seed that happens yep. to work out or or pr- potentially manually placing them to make sure it doesn't happen. I mean, and potentially them bumping in is fine, but I wouldn't mind. Eh, they're being a little picky, but that's fine. Actually, there's a little uniformity to that, so let's go easy. Actually, no, no, no. What am I doing? Okay, so we do this. This is still an entirely cloner-based setup, so how about throwing in a push-apart effector? I almost never use push-apart, but this is a good situation to use a push-apart. So let's drop this radius much. way down. Uh, also, let's... Mm, I'm going to temporarily turn off the volume, which should probably be down at the bottom to be the last thing to calculate. And, oh, the push-apart is really pushing things apart so let's go way easy on that oh is this oh okay it's it this is it's really interesting you gotta keep this kind of stuff in mind but what's happening is it's seeing the modified scale again so even though i'm putting a really tiny radius they're flying really far away but that's because the push apart is oh. calculating after the scaling is happening so if we say okay calm down first push apart and then scale and immediately see everything jump back into line move this in the approximate visual spot and now start increasing this just until we start seeing some movement so you see right there that should be enough to push them completely apart from each other the drips are still hidden turn back on the volume and let's hide some of our original geometry and yeah make sure that 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 does not render and now we get the drips and nothing is bumping into each other and it's looking pretty sweet actually pretty simple um Let's see, just for fun. Okay, we're getting nice playback. So you can actually see, oh, look at those. Uh, And if you want to, I mean, like we're saying, this rig is not necessarily built to have them go off the surface. But if one does happen to be on the surface, like this this one right there, kind of like that that one's hanging out late. If we go far enough, presumably, well, okay, that one must be randomly getting multiplied. Oh, okay, here's what we do. Here's what we do. Um, Inside the plane. Uh, we are currently multiplying, and this could be, a, and because we set this to random, this could be applying everything from a zero to a one, from a black to a white. So something might be full power, something might be minimized, and that's what's happening to this one. Instead, we got two options. We could say overlay instead. So now, no matter what, like, you know, when you overlay two materials on top of each other, if you're overlaying on top of gradient, if something was black, it's going to be still black. If something is white, it's still going to be white. But it's all the middle grays that can be affected. So that means no matter what, with this overlay, there will be some motion from everything. And presumably a lot. You can see how high that will start going. But we can just play in this nice, nice little range here in the beginning. But it's like seeing those drips come off the surface is really neat. So in addition to that, what if we just take that helix and we're building everything really cleanly? Like, let's just pull that a little bit further down into the surface so that when those drips actually begin mm. to exist, they'll pull completely from the surface. Yeah, it'll kind of form from yeah. zero almost. Oh, that's Forming cool. Forming and then pulling up. So, oh, that's looking awesome. Um, now, honestly, there's not, I don't know that there's a ton I can add. Well, what are things you'd like to see added? The one thing I've got in mind is adding a little bit of wobbliness to this flat surface. But what else would you like to see, Nick, before I were to hand this off to you? I think you nailed it. A little bit of like waviness on the top and some sort of um, very subtle or slow movement of the sphere going down. I think that will help sell this. So Ooh, making okay. sure that the top part of that surface and whatever rig you're about to build looks like it's going down a little bit. And I think it will help sell this uh, look of melting away rather than just drips coming out. Um, and then the wave thing that you said, uh, like a little little warbly on the top uh, to, to sell it or yeah. c- a couple of thoughts in my head. Um, that That's the main one. Yeah, um, sounds good. So, a couple different things we do. First of all, as Nick was saying, it might be nice to have the chocolate melt away. I'm going to keep calling it chocolate, even though maybe in the oh, end we'd make sorry, it something I'm, not chocolate. I'm going to add one more thing because um, uh, Zach, I go by Zach in the chat, has a good idea that I think will help sell it at the end. An overall uh, like distortion for the whole thing that will push and pull some of these strands a little bit crooked. Um. That, that might be at the very end where we, we do some big deformer kind of 3D noise kind of thing to it that just makes sure. it a little bit less straight up. But I would I would say that might be fun to do because I think it'll be pretty straightforward and quick. But uh, I'll let you go ahead and make the, the top wave here. Yeah, sounds good. Um, temporarily hide all of our 
volume bring back the bool now this is maybe a little bit dangerous because just because we know bools can be weird but the most straightforward way i can think to deform the surface is let's just add some subdivisions we don't even have to go terribly crazy but if we add some subdivisions to this cube then we can deform this cube before it even bools it out and then the resulting shape can become the surface this oh, can cool. be pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to do my plane deformer. Actually, we'll be using this twice, but dropping this plane effector into the cube, I would like this to be treated as a point deformer. And as I usually do, let's rename that deform just so we remember what that is. And actually, we should be doing that in a lot of these. Like this is a random dot scale, and this is a plane dot y plus. Um, just to move there, push apart, self-explanatory. I don't need to explain that. Okay, so this cube is going to be deformed via point. Currently, it is pushing on Y, local Y. So we'll get rid of that. I think Z is the one we want. Yeah, if I push Z, you see everything moves up and down. So right now, I'll just say 22. Uh, actually, that's a lot. Say 11. But we don't want it applied everywhere. So in the fall off, give that some noise. So here we go. See. Um, so people are saying it's a little bit of lag, but that might be Twitch because my mine says we haven't even dropped a single frame. So hopefully we're going well. Okay, so now you see this random field. Uh, this is currently based on noise. I'll make it. Uh, let's increase the scale. I always do this. I keep on increasing the scale until we start seeing some uniformity, just so we know what the ballpark of what this is supposed to be is. And now that we've got that, we could start shrinking it back down again, knowing what the scale is, and then perhaps we'd want doubling up the resolution. Just a little bit more there. This random noise can be anything we want. In this case, mm, Naki maybe. I like a nice Naki. It's all going to get smoothed out anyway, so we don't have to worry too much. Scale it up again for that uniformity. It's a little subtle. So how about cranking up the amount of deformation? That's pushing there we down. go. That's fine. Yeah, there we go. And if we were inclined, this wouldn't be terribly difficult. Actually, yeah, this would be fine if we, well, if we wanted to which we do, we can add in something like a spherical field, which is right in the center. And now we can create some additional fall offs. So it could be like a little bit weaker in the middle. That spherical field could be set to overlay, which I think is a good idea. Um, too powerful right now, but we always pull back. It's always a good idea to go too far and then pull back. And then under remapping, I'm gonna say invert. So now we can decide exactly how and where things are getting applied. Actually, I kind of liked it the other way. Just a yeah, little. I would, I would say go the other way because if this was in a uh, in a glass, whatever, you'd have that little like meniscus at the end, kind of curling up, you yeah. know, like uh, like the liquid anyway. So that this like con con uh, cave kind of thing, I think was yeah. looking pretty good. Yeah. So just by setting this to overlay, we can set the exact amount of power we want, just a little bit, just to imply cool. a little bit of dip there. But we can still see it get all messed up there. We can pick a nice angle. Now, um, we just have to make sure that our helix will always be low enough to be underneath the shot. So we can get fancier with that if we need to. I'm not super worried about it, but the main thing is going to be just taking this cube and moving it up and down. It looks like the bool is cooperating. We're not getting any bad pops anywhere. So how about just a quick keyframe here? We'll keep this simple. A, uh, I'll set to linear control D and say key interpolation, set this to linear. So when I create keyframes, they're not easing in and easing out. So at the time of zero, That'll be the arbitrary height. And how long do you want this to be? 90 frames, three seconds? What are you thinking? Yeah, I would say like a three, four second thing. And I think it's important too, it's uh, good that you pointed that out, Chris, that linear keyframes are uh, perfect for when you want to capture the action mid-action, you know, it, which is exactly what we're doing in this shot. To go back to the start of what is this rig for? It's for capturing the middle part where we maybe slow things down and see it really move slow. And so in that case, you do want it linear. Yeah, uh, we're catching it mid-action. Exactly. It's already moving. And and uh, I think that's important when you think about your camera moves, uh, all this stuff. Like li linears, it, it, if you're cutting to action that's already happening, linear often is a, is a great place to start. You just so don't want to see the first... For, for, 
you just never want to see the first frame of linear keyframe almost. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, we wouldn't want if the animation to begin, we wouldn't want it already doing this. But, mm -hmm. um, okay, so now we've got this movie down. I, because the drips aren't sucking out too much volume from it, let's leave it nice and slow. But it's traveling down, so how about adding a little bit of animation speed into this? Okay, we got to go really easy on it. Yeah, super. I think this is like even a less, slow like mo. Two percent. Like just a little bit of change between them. And let's keep in mind, it's going to be getting smoothed out as well. So the subtlety, additional subtlety will be added as soon as we reintroduce our volume. Uh, hide the original. Here is our more drippy surface. It is getting smoothed out. And yeah, that is what we've got. Um, I haven't keyframed our linear field. So let's choose where we want this to begin and end. So you tell would, me. Okay, so here's our total range. So when do you want to start? I would say like go, you say stop. Yeah, keep going. There. Wait, like right. Uh, see that one on the right, the little peekaboo right on yeah. the right. Yeah, wait, go down a little bit more. Yeah, right there. All righty, yeah. <laughs> okay. Guess, it's so, it's tricky to time this with somebody when we're in different states <laughs> <laughs> streaming. <laughs> I mean, the tech is pretty amazing if you think of it, but I, it is like uh, right there. Wait, go back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, now, the ground has moved down, which automatically did a little bit of movement for it. But where do you want to end? Uh, there. There. It's. I, I imagine this is a super slow-mo cut, cut it, zoom in. Okay. Uh, we're not getting real-time play. Well, let's turn this off for just a second so we can get some real-time playback. So here's what we're actually getting. Blur. Yeah, dude. I want to zoom way in on this thing excellent so uh not too much more for me to do here before nick gets his hands on it let's do that giant deformation you were talking about i think that could be cool yeah i i've got one more quick request chris which is take those top drippy sphere squares mm -hmm. and and either add a little teardrop to the bottom of them so they're a little bit less spherical or just scale them like on the on the y just to give them a little bit more uh, I don't know drippiness and less. Sure, no, I'm like with the, you. The sphere, you know what I'm saying? I got, I have a, I, I have a prediction though because the volume builder was saying that it's seeing the particle size. I bet you that it doesn't see its x, y, and z. It probably only sees one dimension. But that's not to say we can't fix it because I know ways to fix it. But let's just grab the overall. This is going to grab every single point on the matrix. I'm going to say scale vertically. And you see they're scaling up uniformly. Even though I'm only scaling on Y, they're scaling up overall. So I, I see. can't see them individually. We have two options. One would be turn these into geometry and they could be stretched. And then the second idea, and this could be silly, but my thought is just to do something different, would be let's make a drip two. And these drip two are doing the exact same thing. Except I'm going to say, okay, yeah, you're doing your thing, but Just back yourselves up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> back up a little bit, and then we'll scale them down a little bit. Uh, uh, it's yep. pretty good. I, I mean, I would have never thought of that, Chris, but I think you might be on to something here, buddy. It we'll might make it goes. a little extra the way that volume works. It kind of like over adds sometimes, but yeah, this will so be interesting to see if this size, works. Uh, increase the radius. Yep, there we go. <gasps> My blah, 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 goodness. Blah, 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 blah. My there goodness. Yep. Yeah, so personally, probably making a sphere or even making a slight teardrop shape on the original thing wouldn't yep. be a bad idea. Um, in fact, we could you could go crazy advanced probably. And no, that probably wouldn't work. I was going to say make a taper that follows along the spline, but I don't think that would actually work. But you can see that that did indeed process. I'm going to scroll a couple frames just to make sure nothing's popping too bad. We can increase the resolution. In fact, I almost guarantee you're going to. Like, so why don't we even right now just drop this voxel size down to two? But the important thing to do is because we're dropping it down now, because there's an increased resolution, the effectiveness of our smoothing is going to be lessened. So now we have to increase the iterations to get the same visual result. Of course, this will slow everything down, but now we have a higher overall resolution to make everything nice and smooth. And I think that's working pretty well. That should calm everything down a bit. There should be less popping. The blobs are emerging. All right, let's just get that overall deformation going because I thought that was a neat idea. And my thought is, I guess we've got a lot of geometry here. I'll hit save again. But why don't we just do another deformation on this overall shape and we'll process it pre-smoothing so we can really mess it up and then let the smoothing fix it. So mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, here's the way I'm thinking we do it. Actually, let's just steal this plain deform. So I'm gonna copy that, but I don't I don't want the contents. So you can see this is just super inflating everything. So that's way too much. But let's uh, let's go a little easy on it. Just we'll start we'll start here. Inside the fall off, create another random field. And now you see it's only applying in some places. The random field, set that to normal. Here's the overall scale. We can make that larger. Let's add a lot of verticality to it. I think just in general, it could, like a, a general vertical stretchiness could give it the upward motion in general. So yeah, I mean, that's really coming through on this shape, a little less so on the vertical ones, but that could be if we shrink down our x and z so let's drop those down to let's try 22 22 and then you can start seeing a lot more individualized messing up on everything could be fine now you see i'm super duper messing this up in fact we are just straight up inflating it outward there's things we could do to push it in and out but let's just see what happens if we now say okay but then the smoothing happens and actually just to show you if i turn this on and off it just seems it smooths out so much that it just seems to um erase out all that, it just is slightly inflating it. So here's a trick I like to do. What if that comes after the smoothing and we can go pretty light on this. We don't wanna go too far, but like it is a smoothed out version. And then we'll just make another smoothing deformer. No, nothing says we can't. So another smoothing de deformer, but this time we're just worried about smoothing out that extra deformation we made. So we'll just calm it down a little bit there. Oop, I didn't copy, make a duplicate of it. Bring that back to 33. Okay, so now we get the super smoothing one, a little bit of deformation, and then a little bit of smoothing again, just to pull back on these imperfections and let them very smoothly get laid out. So let's just see what this this deformer is now doing. That mm, should we should I put the effort in to make it go negative as well? Because it's kind of making everything a little fatter. It's I too like yeah. It, 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 I I do like it skinnier. Yeah. So let's try and make this go in and out, or actually. I could mess it up, but let's just try inverting this. Let's just say, hey, this goes negative. So it's going to make everything skinnier. Ooh. Um, Ooh. And then the smoothing, we just have to make sure, we don't want to go so far that this happens. Yeah, you so don't want the pinch. Um, so one, like if we put enough smoothing after the fact that we could potentially prevent it that way, but it does get really thin. Um, um, I guess we just, if this is the one that's sticking out as getting pinched, why don't we just make sure it's not pinching quite as much? Perfect. And even that's probably like 2.5 or something. Super skinny. Ooh, there I go. like it. So this isn't going to play back in any kind of real time, but it's still very scrubbable. Drip. And I mean, there's a lot we could do. We could modify... We, we could we could be animating the scale of these drops as they go upward. We could be having some drops loose in the air traveling away. Um, there's there's potentially a lot of options, but I don't know how much I think, further we're going to go on the like, modeling. The only other piece of art direction I have, Chris, is now that I see those thin things, mm -hmm. we should take the big drip and the medium drip, like the top and the taper, and just scale them both down a little. Sure thing. Like they're still a little too... Bug bubbly. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn the bottom one off so we can just observe the top, and we'll just change the radius inside the volume builder. Let's ooh, take it. Yep. Well, yeah. Well, you can see we got a big one there, a small one there. We can do different random seeds and get a really nice looking one, but let's go pretty easy on it. Yeah. What do you think? Something like there? That's, that's looking good, dude. Um, yeah. And then what is? These are controlled. Yeah, this is the upper drip. I'm going to grab both at the same time. And if we were to do this, we can, of course, pick different random seeds until we are like, that one looks good or that one looks good. So, you know, we've got the opportunity to change the seed. And then let's turn the bottom drip back on to get the extra pinching. Although it's still pinching pretty well without that because of all the extra smoothing. Yeah. So let's grab this and shrink that radius down. Yeah. Oh, right there, buddy. Yeah. So obviously this can all continue to be tweaked. And I mean, what's cool, I mean, this is a super, I'm going to save it right there, but super duper parametric setup we can go back into the cloner and say hey i want like four times as many drips and it'll just create four times as many so that's what's great about the rig that we just set up everything can be changed we could even add an individual one if we wanted to um so yeah anything else you want to see here before i send it your way scrub through there chris let me see where we're going let's do a nice flat Ooh, one so buddy. i'm gonna attempt to scroll in real time because we're not going to get real time playback yeah, I think, oh, depending yeah. on how you deliver it to me, uh, what do you think is best 
especially for live stream, do you want to give me a fake, or do you want to give me this raw, or do you want to? I'll give it. I'll give. I'll give it to you in this state because, well, first of all, it'll be really quick to transfer. If we bake it down or do an alembic, it's going to. Um, yep. Big, big old file. It's going to be a giant file. So, uh, yeah, let's I'll give, give that it a, a save. Go. Um, I'm going to put, just so it's going to be clear on your side, I'll set, save this as C underscore Chris. Save, and now give me a moment, everybody, as I put this in Dropbox so that Nick can get access to it. I should have been saving these directly in Dropbox. But... Let me, uh, give me just a sec before you switch over, Chris. I'm going to make sure I got it all, and it's in here. Dropbox. Where did I put that? Uh, live stream guest sync. Nick and paste. And it's super tiny. It's only 166 kilobytes, which is great for, that's why I love parametric. All right, let me let me give it a test here first before yeah. we. Uh... Let me know and I'll switch over. Okay, we got, we got playback. All right, we got playback. <laughs> the goo guru. <laughs> the g- <laughs> this looks great okay um i think as long as at the end chris could i put a smoother on it oh yeah dude, you, can, you, it can, you can change a bunch of stuff um yeah, i figured it'd be fine I mean, you can even bake it as soon as it gets on your end but we just want to send it over clean so uh, the file should pop over make sure it opens and then i'll switch to your screen uh i think i'm ready let's give it a go i know we were having some tech issues here earlier guys so let us know if you could see everything uh and chris i can't see the other screen so just let me know when i'm live here you are now live and i am seeing your mouse we had to do some workarounds to make the mouse work we had to do a bunch of workarounds but we're yeah, now you may see my nice. fa- you may see the mouse trail <laughs> for whatever reason turning that on on windows uh helped one of those magical windows things so yeah, pardon the, the share- mouse trail we're not yeah, the, in the 90s the, the sharing the you. sharing app didn't allow the mouse to come through so turning on <laughs> mouse trail tricked it into sending it uh okay so here's where we are uh chris this is this is awesome great stuff as always we got our scrub and i i've always pictured as you as you built this thing we're kind of so just just so i could kind of visualize to imagine this commercial okay so first of all um the first thing you worry about is your camera right if you've known me you know i'm always yelling about picking the right camera in this case it, it would like start off with some like kind of like 70 millimeter zoom kind of like centered spherical thing in the center of the frame so now imagine this whole thing is like a big sphere just wanted to we're not going to work on this whole thing, but just so we can set up the shot. Imagine for the sake of this commercial, it starts with this perfect chocolatey sphere. Then you start to see these little drips go up fast, like shroom, shroom. it starts like melting away. The, the level comes down and these drips start flying in the air. Then we get to this kind of middle area. This is when we, we cut. I'm, I'm actually just going to duplicate our camera. We're not going to do the full edit or anything, but this is when we cut in. And if you remember the the goo rock, we actually did this. We did the the the, the um, kind of opener shot, oh, yeah. and then we zoomed in to this kind of close up to really see what the heck's going on in this thing. And we showed all this detail, and then we backed out again. Watch the rest of it dissipate. And in the goo rock, it was like closing into a rock or whatever. But you get the idea. Okay, so that's all I was talking about at the beginning. But let's start making this look look like chocolate. Let's do it. So um, first thing I do is I'm actually going to copy and paste this whole thing into an Octane starter scene. And this is something that I've built using Octane so that I don't have to reset up my render settings, reset up my, oh, my favorite uh, kind of setup every time I use Octane. So I'm going to immediately do that. I'm going to copy it. We're going to go into this Octane starter scene. You can see it's already here uh, in the live viewer. But this scene is set up just so I have some basics that I use all the time, right? I got little shapes here. I got a background. I got HDR all set up, ready to go. Got some materials in my scene so I could instantly just drag them in. This is how I like to start, especially with the third-party renders. So let's just copy this in paste it in i should say and i put it in a null so that i can move it back around and i could just put it right in the center of my scene here 
and now I could get rid of, of course, all this other stuff. And now I have this beautiful drippy drip up in Octane. And Chris, since I don't have um, the view, uh, the, 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 the chat or anything visible, please let me know if, if uh, something pops up um, uh, that I can answer or, or, you know, if I'm missing sure something. Okay. I think everybody's Are, just mesmerized right now. So, I mean, Octane's beautiful, isn't it? Like, you know, I think Redshift is just as beautiful. I think Octane's a little bit faster with this stuff where it's just like the grain goes away in half a second and done. <laughs> yeah, like, I think Octane definitely gets you where you're going faster, and it looks best out of the box. It's it's mesmerizing. So um, I'll break down some of the settings if you guys want. I'm using LUTs, and I'm using a lot of stuff to kind of dial this look in. Um, but let me know if you have any questions. But for now, let's just set up some basic like uh, like food material, right? So chocolate. So first thing I'll do, actually, let me show off our new search in the library. If you're a Plus member, you have all these materials. We just added search, and I think there's actually a chocolate. There is a chocolate. Jeez Louise. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so we have this chocolate. I think it's part of the Everyday Material Collection. Uh, let's just drag it on. And what's great is, you know, a lot of you are like, well, look, that's great. You get a chocolate right away, but I want to know how to make a chocolate from scratch. Well, you could open these up and they're all open nodes ready to go. And you can see how this is set up. So we have a little scattering here. We have some rounded edges to, to round it off, which actually buys us a little bit more detail there on the edge. And then we have some scattering, which I think is kind of, you know, kind of our subsurface scattering. We may have to dial that in. So let's actually dial that in. And this is why we leave all these nodes open here so we could kind of lower it, see what happens. So let's yeah, go to our 100. Yeah, file is pretty large. It's a big giant sphere and not like the head of a person, so. We probably need yeah. a lot of <laughs> treat this bigger or scale everything down. Yeah, so I'm actually just going to keep dropping this density until we see something drastic. So there we go. So that's too much, right? Like we could see through this chocolate. This, this is not that's like Dr. Good... Pepper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, if we go a little bit lower, I think we'll get like a little root beer or something weird yeah. red redness. But yeah, Dr. Pepper, that's a better one. Okay, but you know, 10, we're still seeing through it. But this is where you could start to dial this in. And say, okay, now we're actually, ooh, now we could actually see through some of these strands, which I think for chocolate is a, is a bit much. Um, but if we find the right thickness, then it'll go a long way with a lot of these drippies. I'm going to yeah. move forward further in the scene so we could see more drippies. Uh, I don't know if that's going to affect, do I have to go frame by frame, Chris? No, because no. we're not doing uh, we're not doing tracer. Okay, so now we got some of that. So now let's frame up something that is a little bit closer to what I imagine our close-up oh. will be. As soon as you zoomed in, it's automatically like, ooh, there you go. Yeah, so uh, so a couple things we'll probably need to do. One is throw it in a, um, uh, in a subdivision surface, which I'm just going to knock it to one just for live streaming. And also, I don't think we need a lot of extra but some of the, these little details in the ground, I just think we need to ease up. I think I could just drop the whole null in here. I'm actually so. going to save on my side, Chris. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, you uh, might want to just drop in, the volume, but yeah, save it. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, let's save uh, as. Okay. And uh, we could put this in here. And uh, remind me, Chris, about the scene file and all that stuff. Oh, I'll, I'll just uh, rename it. Just go ahead. And... Uh, rocket. Uh, one. Chocolate. Rocket chocolate. Rocket chocolate. Changing well, the business. Dude, let's go. Okay. Yeah, go inside so, and drop the volume builder in it, not everything. Yeah, the volume measure. There you go. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. Okay. I think we're on to something. Okay, so this is more of what I imagine our zoom in will be. So let's set up our shot. Um, I think I kind of want... Like, let's play around with the camera. What's really nice about um, Octane is you can see your results so fast, you could try totally different camera angles. One of them I'm imagining is this, okay? It's totally straight on, totally zoomed in, and we might even have to rotate around here and try to get some of these other angles. But that some sort of side shot might be very visual. This is overly lit now, so I'm just going to go into our HDR and uh, rotate it. Right. This is actually the octane sky. We're just gonna rotate that around. We might play around with some other lighting options, but ooh, look at that. Got some nice yeah. backlighting. So 
this is the first thing I would do is just set up what we want our shot to kind of feel like. Is it is it moody uh, from the back? Let's zoom back out and show the difference. Like imagine if the first shot of this was more like that. Remember the last one, how bright oh, yeah. it was? Like look at how much more moody and um, I don't know, like essential of the right word for chocolate. You know, like this is very album cover, stark, quiet um, feeling where the other one was like, you know, hey, kids, let's bite into some chocolate, you know, like, let's just rotate that around and show the difference. Um, but this is where I go, especially with something like Octane, where we could get those uh, uh, so quickly. Look at that. Totally yeah. different result. That's like a date. This is a Saturday morning commercial. You know, this. I mean, that uh, that's I don't think you should put that on air. Frankly. Yeah. You know, like that's <laughs> like spooky. But that this is the power of of lighting and the ability to change this stuff really easily. So this is um, kind of where I go first. But the, uh, the chat is of the opinion that it's a little transparent and looks more like barbecue sauce. Yeah, it, I think so too, especially when we do the zoom in guys, I think the strands are a little transparent. So we're going to thicken that out. Thank you guys. Um, okay. So that, so now we have what we kind of like it. So I think we're actually going to keep this backlit for now. We're going to zoom in and we're going to see if we can get something that looks a little bit more dynamic. Now this backlight, we may have to cheat it when we zoom in because it's so shiny right here. Um, so let's move that around. Yeah, right there, That that's not chocolatey enough, is it, guys? So let's jump in to our material. I think it was under trans uh, medium. Uh, and actually, it was up in the scattering. So we got to go into our node, go into our scattering. Let's make it visible, and let's dial it up. So let's just double it, roughly. Okay, that's better already. So we got we got that. The other thing about this with chocolate is we got this daylight, and this like daylight color with chocolate is kind of weirding me out when I zoom in. Something about it out here is fine. It almost looks like a little planet, but when we zoom in and we start getting these these like bluish colors in the chocolate, I'm a little I'm a little freaking out. And in fact, when we zoom in, it makes it feel a little bit more like a product shot. So we could actually dial that in real fast. This uh, HDRI link's all set up right here, and we could just dive into something like oh, I got to clear my search. We got uh, Pro Studios Metal might be because this is really reflective. We might get yeah. some really nice. This might as uh, well be made of metal. Yeah, exactly. We got these nice kind of reflective parts here that we could jump through. This might be too overlit. Yeah, yeah. We don't want this overlit one. This one might be good. Let's zoom back out and see where we are, especially the side look, which I really enjoy. I'm kind of debating keeping it at this scale. We might still do the zoom in, guys, but I kind of enjoy this look so much. I kind of want to keep it here, but yeah. you guys let me know. Um, okay, so... Let's let's do that for now. So the obvious next thing I want, whenever I want a close up, you probably know what I'm going to say. I want some depth of field. So let's go into our uh, Octane camera rig here. Let's go to depth of field, and let's turn on. Actually, let's go into f-stop, and let's turn our f-stop to two. Okay, two's pretty zoomed in. Might have to dial it back a little bit. I'm gonna turn on my focus thing here. And this tie focus it to thing, that. can you just now click places and get a different focus? Is that what that's doing? Nick? Uh oh. We, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Nick, but we still see your screen, yep. but I've lost sure. your audio. Okay. Oh, wait, you seem to be back. Okay, I could I could hear I could okay, hear yeah, you now, buddy. Yeah, yeah, Can you yeah hear right. me? Okay, so back to uh, you clicked the focus thing. Is that just resetting your focus? Yeah, if you leave this on in Octane, then you can. Uh, let me turn up our f stop just a little bit more. It's kind of unrealistic, but I'm going to prove a point. Um, if you leave this on, wherever you click will go in in focus. Nice. So so now the back piece is in focus. You can see up front is out, and if I click on I don't know this close up dot right here. You can see the rest goes out of focus. So uh, that's all, and I'm, I'm I'm making sure our subdivisions 
surface is working the way I want it. What I might do, can I add a octane round, like a rounding tag here right on the mesher? I think I can. So I'm going to add maybe uh, even moving up to the submission octane surface. message. Mm, okay, that let me let me try it here first. Um, let's go, go to. I always forget where it is. Subdivision well, group, and just to subdivision level it, one. To throw it out there, this is a little bit of a, a, it's a thing that happens, but because we put a, such a strong smoothing on there, the smoothing can give you these little pinches, like it's valid geometry, but you get these sharp pinches. And I think those sharp pinches are what are bothering you. Um, it's yep, a little bit that, of a weird. That is on the bottom. Yeah. Um, and you can see it on some of the drips where there's like these little sharp points on the drips. It's not a, it's not the workflow. I, I, I would do it, but it's not the cleanest workflow, but essentially I would take this entire volume measure and then feed it into a brand new volume measure that's observing the previous state. And it'll give you a nice smooth out one. Another alternative would be using the new remesher, um, which could then clean it all up, but that might look a little bit janky from frame to frame. So yeah, there's a lot of different choices, but there's definitely, there's some pinching happening and that's because of the smoothing. And no matter how many times we subdivide that, it's still going to happen. Okay, so with, with that and with the old, you know, live TV stuff happening, let's let's focus on this shot because I think it'll be helpful in, in just so we have a final finished shot. And then I'll, I'll actually dive into it too with a little bit more time and see what that close up could be and maybe smooth it out because we that was our original goal. But for now, let's just zoom back out to this kind of like almost would be a starting shot. And it could also even be this close up like this might even work just fine. Let's see. There we go. That might be something. Maybe we're a little close. Maybe we're more like this. And let's just find that shot we want to dial in, which this looks pretty good to me. Uh, Chris, sorry about the audio. Can you hear me uh, still yep. okay? Yep, okay, good. Coming through all good. I just want to make sure it was clipping a little bit. So this actually, I think, is a, a good place to kind of like work on our final look, our final lighting, and then we'll just talk about the render settings a little bit as well. So from here, um, what I would usually do, like once I have the camera set up, let's lock this so that it scales down. I think we could scale this down just so we could see the full frame. We're working in this uh, kind of square right now, which I think is okay. I think a square is obviously a pretty popular uh, look right now. But if I were framing this up, I would literally center this dude and get the focus going. Okay, that's looking pretty good. There's something about that strand that's overlapping with this one that's bothering me. So I could literally just grab my uh, volume mesher, rotate it around, just because I like my camera rig enough, I don't wanna mess with it. And I could just cheat it a little bit. Uh, I kinda liked that where it was. That's a little bit better. There we go. Boom. So I like the kind of anti-symmetry of this one. It's a little uh, kind of sideways. Good framing. I like our colors here. So this is where I would say, okay, I'm happy with this um, this look. I will. I would scrub through it. So let's go ahead and scrub through it and say, see what we get. Cool. Oh, that's cool. It kind of blinks on there. So we have this moment in time where it kind of shrinks. Kind of gets blobby. The blobs kind of add later, Chris. You see that on your end? <laughs> yeah, it, it seems to be uh, maybe the it's just the way the volume mesher sees the matrix objects. But yeah, it's like waiting till the last minute. But that's okay. Uh, well, let's just find a beautiful frame. I think the later the better for this one. Boop. We got a little bit more goopy, and then from here, um, let me say from here just because I like this framing and I think we're at a, a, a pretty cool point. Um, save it, then. What we then what I would do is okay we're working with the client I would either think about options to give them or even myself I would say okay this is look this looks good but can we make it better right and so what are the ways that what are the things that we could do to make it better well first of all because it's on this um, uh, because it's on this S table platform this like psych we're missing all the reflections on the bottom that might show up from this HDR so one thing I'm I'm gonna do is let's just collapse this for now. Let's turn off our uh, Octane camera and talk about, uh, first of all, just moving this platform down um, and just shrinking it until it's a little bit more out of the way. So let's go to the S-curve. Let's go to the depth. Definitely don't need that much depth. And the height is fine. I think what I'm just gonna do is drop this way down 
so it's a lot more out of the way. And uh, on obviously, we can also just rotate it and just use the back of it or just use a plane because we're not really sh doing the floor. So let's just go ahead and do it the right way. Boom. Get a plane. Still like the backdrop, but I think the psych is getting in the way of some of the reflections. So let's just hide that for now. And one thing I want you to notice when we go to our camera is how much the color changes. And that's because of the LUT that we're using. I've been falling in love with using um, these camera LUTs right in Octane. Um, and I'm still learning more about the ACES workflow. I know that's a lot of questions, people asking questions about that. But even just adding a LUT in um, Octane just adds all this nice little compression of the, the color detail and a little bit more solid like black area down here. Um, but I already I like this more. So let's keep tweaking just for a few more minutes just to see if we could plus it any better before we sh you know, ship this off to the client or before we send them something. Let's try a few more of these um, uh, uh, studio maps. Here's one that's a little bit brighter. I'm not in love with... I'm not in love with the front corner of this, Chris, but I like the lighting on this one. Sometimes when I like the overall feel, I just kind of like rotate it and say like maybe it just has to go somewhere else. Yeah, oh, it Some... definitely was super warm and friendly, but the uh... I mean, when you say the front corner, do you mean the lighting on the front corner or the literal front corner? It's it's a little bit of both, actually. Like the harsh lighting on the front was bad. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, that's. Uh... Oh, that's... Octane. I'm actually going to use this and boost it up just a little bit. Okay, we're losing a little bit of our chocolate. We may have to go back a little bit as far as where this goes chocolate-wise. And I think overall what this really is doing to me is the reflection in general is just too much. It's like it's 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 what is bothering me through the whole thing like this, the way that this reflection is like that. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe just blurring it up a bit or? Yeah, yeah. So I just think a little bit of roughness, I, it's maybe not – what chocolate does perfectly, but I think it's okay for a little bit of art direction here. So that helps already. Um, let's continue a couple more and then we'll set up uh, our final render settings. I always want to make sure we get to like all the way to the final render um, before we change anything. And just in case we're not, we're missing something, let's make sure it's not like what we, what we really need to be is like, indoors but in a much more realistic environment with a lot more windows and all that kind of stuff so i always last minute are like am i just way off base mm -hmm. here let's try That's something really cool. different yeah i did like that last one this like overly top lit one's nice yeah Ooh, even that that, one that, that pops heart, the corner easy. really nicely yeah this this little highlight over here i think when we figure out the rounding and all that it'll be perfect but let's let's keep this here and then let's do our kind of final framing or final render Got our got our our new album cover here, Chris. Um, yeah, and it looks delicious. It is really tasty. So let's go ahead and focus in right, maybe right in the middle there, just to get that piece. Um, and that is it. Uh, the only thing I'm thinking is the LUT is a little bit heavy-handed. So I'll come in here. I'll show you where to add. If you haven't messed around with LUTs in Octane, um definitely check it out there's this tab right here custom LUT and um here's here's what it looks like without the LUT right it's okay it's like a little washed out compared to what we had before but as we dial this up look at what happens we get all this contrast all these nice uh compression of the um the the uh highlight here from the window and again maybe there's an easy way to go zero to one but here's none right oh, that's okay Boom. And all of a sudden you get all this nice little detail. So this is good. I'm going to try rotating it just a little bit just to catch that corner a little bit out front more. Ooh, where it goes. Roop. Yep. Dig it. Um, I think this is where I would leave it. So from here I would just do a render uh, full frame to check the overall resolution. Um, I don't even know what we're, our settings are set up here. I don't think we need all that, all those samples. Let's go to 2,000 samples. Let's go 1600 is fine. Let's just render. Do you want to continue without saving? That's totally fine. Um, my favorite uh, uh, key command that Chris taught me, it's control tab to uh, <laughs> blow up an entire window just like this. And now we can sit here and watch it render. So um, Chris, can you check the chat for any questions or anything we should look at? I think this is actually on frame 
one, we, we should change the frame. So let me do that. Check uh, for any questions before we, I'll pitch it back over to you here in just a second. Sure. Um, let's see. No, mostly people are just <laughs> making comments about chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the the overall material needs dialed in just a bit. It's a little red for me. Um, that also could be the LUT pushing up the the chocolatiness, like the the um, coloring a little bit off on that. But that's that's the last little tweaks where you know we could spend a half an hour dialing in the exact perfect chocolate texture. But uh, let's see how this looks. This is much later in the framing here. I think it's just taken a while to calculate the later state of this thing but it should yeah. start firing up we'll get a nice little render here anything else from the chat um question uh which LUT did you use somebody's asking yeah so uh this is actually um i'm gonna get in trouble for this but this, this is actually a, a pack that's not out yet <laughs> it's, like <crazy laughs> color LUT. it's um, a tease it's an exclusive it, tease yeah, it's an un uh, it's it's a it's an unwarranted. Uh, I didn't I didn't ask the team for this one, but uh, the too late. You guys asked, so I'll, I'll show you. Um, it's this really beautiful set of filmic LUTs uh, that we're working on. It's not even uh, quite complete yet, but um, this is one of my favorites. It's, it's the first one in the set, and these are really built to emulate using uh, film using really subtle but beautiful color correction right from within Redshift, Octane. Uh, I think Arnold also they all use LUTs. Um, and you could just instantly get that look right away. So yeah, um, well, there's even no, the uh, the new Magic Bullet look, so you could even run the LUTs directly in the Cinema viewport. Oh, that's true. So you could do it in post, right within uh, Magic Bullet looks. And um, if you are in Plus, or if you bought this pack in the in the past, we do have the Grayscale Gorilla uh, looks, uh, or uh, it's not called looks. Um, the the Grayscale Gorilla LUT uh, collection. If you have those, those work in here, right? Uh, really easy. And in fact, I think it's in a newer version of Octane. Uh, if you steer it to the folder where these LUTs are, you could then use this LUTs preset and just like toggle through them. These are the default ones that come with Octane. Some of these are pretty good. Um, but uh, if you have any LUTs or you're using the Grayscale Gorilla LUTs, you could load them up right within here and then use these LUT presets to, to dial in. And I think you could actually dial it in in the Octane uh, settings itself tell Octane exactly where your LUTs are, and that makes it really, really easy to uh, kind of toggle between all of them. Okay, so here we are. Uh, just last minute things before we pitch it back over to you, Chris. There's still a little bit of a smoothing issue. I, honestly, I think it's probably just the resolution of my screen. Yeah, that goes away when I do that. Um, there's a little bit of, of smoothing I would do around this edge. It's a little yeah, janky that's in this the corner. pinching I was talking about. That's the pinching you were saying. So that's the only really issue there. Um, I think what where we where we are with this, if we're if this was in a real production, is I would go make many different shots in this style, maybe a couple different styles, maybe one a little bit more moody, maybe one a little bit more kid friendly, and prep it for my client, right, and say like, hey, here's what I'm thinking of where this style can go. It could be very moody and dark. It could be very, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's where I would take this. So there you go. Um, almost done rendering. And if there's no more questions, Chris, I think we could pass it back to you and see what's next yeah, see what's next on the list um, nice work yeah. i love this stuff man this thing looks great somebody's asking if you could maybe set it up to do a uh, maybe a lower resolution animation so we could see the entire thing play out maybe we could jump back over yeah. to you after it's rendered a bit yeah um, also i'll set that up um if you even if you want to pitch it back yeah. uh i could set that up in a kind of minimal way here yep yeah, you're still turn down the settings cool let's see uh yeah Perfect render for Easter time. Ooh, chocolatey Easter. Let's go. Um, I don't, I don't have a great answer for this, but Crossfader asked, where was that? But Crossfader was asking if there'd be any way to use like a vertex map to transition this into a secondary material. Um, not a vertex map because it's all parametric potentially i'm wondering i guess you potentially could use a vertex map if you had it baked down to some sort of alembic points mm, no and then, but it still has to be in a point object you can't you can only put a vertex map out if it's a point object so but if you were controlling the vertex map with fields and that would potentially work you could use proximals or the equivalent of the 
that in different renderers. But it's really tricky to do that type of thing when it comes to parametric meshes. I'm going to hit. I'm hitting render. Am I still on the screen? I forget. Yeah, yeah, I sure. can't see it. Yep. Yeah, you're All controlling. Right. Let's see here. All right. Well. Yeah. Oop, are you see? In? Yeah, you're, you're ch getting a little choppy. It might Hit be this the there we can always ping back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pulling. I'm pulling up my screen, and we'll let that chug. And when you got a couple frames, and we can go take a look. Um, before we go any further, I just wanted to address some of the pinching. Um, and so we've got my screen back up here. Hopefully, you can see that if you tab over Nick. But you can see the pinching even right here in the viewport. And this, you know, here's a pinch. And there's one, and there's one. This is something that naturally happens when you start using a lot of smoothing. And I'll show you if I change the mesh type here that actually this is just a one little extra polygon that happened to get created just because that mesh was popping up. But if I were to turn off all of our deformation, you see that this mesh was significantly different than it was. So that's, this might have been better in this condition. But once everything gets super smoothed out, that can become a problem. Uh, several things we could potentially do to fix that. Well, one that was popping in my head is this is our final mesh, but we can always go inside of the volume builder. And we've got all of our different layers of mesh going. But if I were to rearrange these a little bit, here is our actual kind of big half sphere blob. So I could create a smoothing deformer that only applies to everything that's below it. So if we just had a little bit of smoothing on this bottom layer, you can see we probably erase out a lot of, you can actually see the pinches like even here. But as I start to smooth this out, the smoothing is probably going to take care of most of those, and those kind of pop out of existence largely. Mm -hmm. It's possible other ones pop into existence, but yeah, that does seem to help a bit there. That, like I said, this is largely an artifact of the smoothing. So a, I actually just want to experimentally do this, is we've got the new Cinema Remesh. So this came out in R23. If I hold down Alt, this will become a parent of it. And we can see right here, it's recalculating. It's kind of caching the internal, I'm not actually not entirely sure what it does inside, but it's caching the geometry we're feeding it. And now it's looking at the, the different mesh. I'm gonna say keep the outline, which should maintain everything here. And now we did not change the poly count. This is attempting to maintain about the same poly count, but look at this very different mesh that we are getting. Everything's been put down to these perfect quads and occasional triangles, which you see is obviously very different than if I turn it off, about the same dash, uh, a mesh density, but we get all these quads that are kind of meeting in odd angles. So just by throwing this into the remesher, this might give us a better overall mesh, but I mean, if this gets really thin, we might end up losing things like that. I'm not super experienced in playing with this too much. I've used it in very basic ways. Um, so I'm not sure what the best setting for maintaining that yet. That's definitely still breaking that. So uh, it'd be something to keep in mind. Um, but you could, of course, drop the poly count or increase it. So that was one option. Here's the perhaps slightly crazier option. And I don't necessarily recommend this, but if I was working on a on something for a client and I had a deadline and I couldn't get rid of those pinches, what I would do is take this entire volume mesher, make a completely brand new volume builder, volume mesher. So we'll put the builder in the mesher. And now that that is here, I can say, okay, in the builder, and I will leave them as separate objects. I'm gonna take the volume builder and say, okay, take this other mesh back inside of it. And so we're kind of doing this little inception thing where we're feeding it into itself. But now this is going to end up smoothing out all those pinches. We just have to lower our voxel size to such a size that's definitely gonna catch, you know, even these thinnest, parts of the mesh, but those pinches should pretty much be gone just because it's remeshed everything complete. This is unrelated geometry to the original one. It's just happening to reference it. So um, maybe even a little smoothing on this just to get rid of a little bit because you still get these kind of like these angles, but that uh, that's a, a thing I would probably do if I needed to. But once again, that's still all the volumetric like you're talking about the edge like i already smoothed it out so that might improve things but if you didn't like the edge we could always go to this cube and just say hey let's do a different seed different seed and then you could of course get the exact edge that you want each of these being completely different and of course you know you always have the option of popping out the sculpting tool and actually making the shape that you want or deforming it after the fact how's the uh, render going pretty good we got 15 frames <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> maybe need a few more extra seconds here uh, let's see. Yeah. Proxima. Somebody's just asking proximal question mark. Um, I don't really have, I don't want to do a big demo. 
on Proximal, but here's the 30 second version. I'm gonna create a null. When I was talking about Proximal to transition materials, pretty much we just need to make, make a mask of some sort. And so using the vertex map is a way of making a mask, but in vanilla cinema, we can create a new material. I'm in fact just gonna use the luminance channel inside of here, put an effect Proximal and inside the proximal, it wants an object. So if I were to drag this null in and apply this material to the final rendering mesh and hit render, let's see. Is it too big or too small? I think too small, it should see the null. That should render. Oh, I just hit render again and it popped in. I don't know why it didn't, but now you can see that there's a perfect spherical fall off from that and you could remap this, but this could be used as a mask where perhaps you have the chocolate material here or like a melted chocolate material and a rough chocolate material and potentially move proximals around to do a transition. It's kind of the old school way of doing a vertex map equivalent thing. Just to throw that out there. All right, I think we're getting close here. All right, let me know as soon as you want to, and I'll swap back to your screen. It's uh, almost 30 frames, but I think we're getting the gist. And I could actually t show you the kind of close-up, too, if uh, if you want to zoom yeah. over. All right, hang on. I'm switching back to you. Boop. Okay, you're in control. Okay, so this is the first 30 frames. Now, the speed of why we set this up, I don't think it's the right speed for the wide shot, right? I was kind of framing yeah. the wide shot for the still. But watch what happens when I just zoom, do like a little, oh, zoom, yeah. you know, the, the zoom in. This is why we slowed it down so much is because for how close we wanted to be, I knew that too much speed was going to like be too confusing for the eye. So it, in, in some ways, the more close up you are on something, the more you do want to slow it down and let the detail kind of unfold. So now imagine this shot, but with more rounding and more smoothing, slightly less reflection. And then Chris's new fix for this little corner here. You could see like really how cool that could be like some super zoom in or even even just this part right just kind of reframing it from within the the uh, fake frame here yeah obviously we're we're showing it from this end no the difference but, between the zoom in there is like huge like it looks kind of ridiculous the amount of chocolate that's dissolving away with just these few drips but when you zoom in right. it totally works yeah that's actually that's a good point it looks too much here and then it looks like it might be on the right zone here. And this is where, where Chris kind of started this whole thing off, which is super important is building different rigs for different, uh, you know, parts of the, uh, scene for different, uh, feelings, you know, like this is a, a very close up, uh, very, um, slow mo, uh, romantic almost, you know, I'm getting, I'm, you know, w w you know, I'll just say yeah. sensual, you know, I think it's, I think that's a good word. It's very close up and it's very, um, you could slow it. You could slow this down in a way that makes you want some dang chocolate where this, this does not make me want chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that's something to think about on there. So every, every extra frame it goes, I like it more and more. And if I were to cut this in the middle of a scene, I wouldn't cut it that far back. I would cut it more like right here. I would start the zoom in right there and yeah. maybe a little bit further back. But that's that's kind of where where that would end up. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. And even looking at it again, like we're even getting some extra pops in there. Essentially, even though as much as I love the smoothing deformer, it, like we're over reliant on it here, it would have been better to actually model out a small teardrop shape so that we wouldn't have to smooth so many layers. Maybe like five iterations is good, but 33 is a lot. So you, we're getting these little pops and almost like a stop motion -y vibe to certain angles. And if we just made sure the input mesh was a little cleaner, then that wouldn't be necessary. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really close. Like as a proof of concept, it's done. You know, it's it's just like prepping it for final. Up in the res, you know, maybe art directing one or two more specific blobs. Like you said, Chris, maybe even having a, a drop that is already floating into space, you know? Yeah. So imagine that shot. Imagine a shot where we're following a drop up here and we're just like slowly moving down. Now it's not letting me do it because it pauses, but imagine the framing just like super slow, beautiful. Oh my gosh, I want to yeah. see more. Though that's the kind of camera moves I would start to set up and get get out to the oh, totally. to the client or whatever.
And then like a completely separate rig, maybe where you see one drop of chocolate break off from the stem and then become a sphere. Like that's a completely new unrelated rig. Oh, yeah, exactly. You could have a super zoom, uh, um, like, you know, this close kind of thing that, uh, yeah, that, that that's a perfect example, Chris, of another rig completely that is literally just showing, like, one of these pieces of chocolate turn into, um, you know, turn into a blob or whatever. That could be its own entire rig, you know? Yep. Exactly. I mean, maybe the same shader, maybe largely the same lighting. Not totally, but you could copy and paste them. But yeah, exa yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, before I cut back over to um, either you or someone was asking about the car paints, and since it's I since I know it's going to look good with car paint, I just have to, I just got to do it. Do it, do it. Uh, also, um, somebody's asking: Is there any kind of regular GSG sale that might be coming up before they order their subscription to GSG Plus? Uh, we don't have any sales in the works, but w I will say that if you're looking at uh, Grayscale Gorilla Plus, um, if you if you want to join for the year, I think you get like four months free, essentially. So you save quite a lot if you buy the entire year. And uh, for anybody looking at all these materials and the HDRIs and just looking at Plus in general, we have 60-day money-back guarantee, no questions asked. So we we want to make sure you're in love with this stuff as much as we are. So what I would recommend is getting the year, automatically saving the four months off, essentially, the, the full price, rather than pay monthly. And um, and 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 you absolutely have the, uh, uh, like, guarantee that if it's, you know, not for you or whatever, money back. So that's what I would say is is check out the annual membership. Um, here they are. Look at these guys. I love Ooh. these things. So oh, even the classic like teal to purple. I'm always kind of a sucker for that one. Let, let me uh, um you're getting let me start with more, the um oh, you're back. Yeah, sorry, I hear you pop out too, Chris. Sorry, the choppiness. Oh, this this I think will look pretty good. I'm going to also tone down our depth of field. Uh, let's go to thin lens. Let's just crank up our f-stop. Okay, so I'll just demo you a couple couple of these because they're so fun. They're all drag and droppable, just like all of our materials, but they're also um, uh, openable in nodes. So you can, A, see how this craziness is put together uh, and learn how we set this stuff up. But we also have custom controls over things like flakes, uh, custom nodes built right in to uh, the shader that allow you to change the scale of the flakes, for example, and scale them up to get a little bit more detail if you need it, um, all this stuff. And we have training on our YouTube on how all this stuff works just to show you where all that is. But a lot of these are just designed to drag and drop. Uh, they look honestly a lot better on cars than on this uh, sphere, but I think it actually comes across pretty good yeah it might be a worse model <laughs> yeah i might want to rotate it just a little bit um just to like that front corner is bugging me so much now but oh and now i got motion blur <laughs> <laughs> okay oh that's funny okay there we go hey that's better let's go to a later frame just so we could get more blobbies i love how it pops in like that let me i'll show you a couple more um the crazy green's a fun one. I don't know how the the camo is gonna. Um, yeah, this is gonna be wrap. maybe mapped oddly, but yeah. But you can see uh, there's some there's some oh, cool wow. ones. Hey, it's yeah. better than I thought. Um, but again, these are designed uh, for getting that really nice highlight. Of course, I got to show you the orange one, um, and just frankly, like show you uh, the the close up. I had a pause. There it goes. So these are really designed, and I'm just going to let this render here for a second. Um, these are really designed for cars. Obviously, those multi-coated car paints that let you, you know, have flakes and then a gloss coat and then a different color coat. Even these color shifting ones, like the holographic one, um, uh, I'm actually going to just going to turn up my render settings so we could see a little bit more resolution here, a little bit more quality. Um, let it go. But you can see you get these beautiful fall offs. This is what car paint does that not just glossy stuff does. You get these nice fall offs and different layers and levels of uh, kind of richness in the paint. So I'll just. Yeah, you uh, definitely will, feel the layers. 
yeah, I'll, I'll do one more because these are really popular right now. These holographic, uh, iridescent kind of uh, looks, um, and these are super beautiful, like really drag and droppable, ready to go. So, um, I, I just got to twist my lighting a little bit on this one. Too too front lit. Oh, there we go. Mm-hmm. Love that side lit on this one. Okay, there we go. I'll leave it at that one. But yeah, uh, any, if you have any other questions about this stuff, we just dropped a bunch of videos. You can always check out the website and everything else. But um, I'm just going to keep dragging on materials, Chris, until you cut me off. Yeah, well, actually, a pretty good question. <laughs> somebody somebody is asking, uh, why not Arnold? Um, but I, mean, I would just do that more broadly, like between kind of the big renderers these days, Redshift, Arnold, Octane. I saw some people chatting V-Ray earlier as well. And then um, you've got... Uh, the Corona renderer, right? The um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so why did you currently land on Octane for your preference? And then actually, yeah. an additional question: When it comes to these car paint materials, are these just for Octane? Uh, good questions. I'm gonna try to get to all of them. I'll start with the car paints. The car paints are are fully compatible with Octane, Redshift, and Arnold. Uh, so uh, all of and that's all of our materials, all of our HDRIs. Um. All of all of uh, all of that stuff is across those three major platforms, like it Pro, all of that stuff. I actually um, knew the answer to that. I just wanted to set you up well. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. In fact, you can see I have Redshift ones installed, and the Redshift ones have these awesome little uh, uh, extra um, things here as well. These little dudes. And in fact, if you have the Redshift version of the car paint uh, ones, the little materials are cars. They're super cute. You got to go check them okay. out. Um, not possible on Octane, but um, if you're using Redshift, it is. So first of all, about Plus and about these materials and HDRIs, it is all uh, Redshift, Octane, and Arnold. And then for me, I've used all three. So I started with uh, Arnold because I was on a, a Mac for so long, needed to see the power of this third-party rendering, and just finally broke down and used Arnold. Um, and uh, Chad was using it at the time, and I think there's even a video of Chad kind of showing me how Arnold worked. And so that kind of set me up for like the love of of third party rendering. One of them too was was on one of the live streams we did, Chris, where you had uh, Redshift installed. I don't think we used oh, it yeah. on the live stream. The first time you ever used Redshift was was the last episode of Ask GSG. Yeah, when ev- yeah. everybody was was over at my place. It was insane, and so that that was really the first time I used a third party render like that, that was GPU and it was on a Windows machine and it was super fast. And honestly, that was the moment I, I knew that I had to get one of these PCs and I had to go down this rabbit hole because it's it's amazing. And so Redshift was my render of choice for a quite a quite a while. Uh, you know, obviously Maxon, uh, 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 they're part of Maxon now. So I was like, no brainer, let's do it. Well, and then of course, uh, Octane has always been a big player in this space. It's super beautiful. Every time I saw somebody play with Octane, I was always just like, man, that's a little bit faster and it's a little bit easier to get something beautiful like right off the start. It's just like naturally beautiful. And you know me, I'm lazy with this stuff. I want it looking good. I want it looking good right now. And so I was like, I gotta try this. Um, you know, I gotta try this uh, um, uh, Octane thing. So I installed it, got it work in. Took a little bit of extra to figure out some of the crashing and, and all that stuff. But I, uh, for the last, uh, since since I got it stable, it's been really, really beautiful, really, really fun to use. And um, uh, it's, it's just been a blast. And then, of course, uh, David Aryev uh, made some training for us to, te- to show Octane in like just a few hours, like learn the real basics, get dangerous w- with Octane. And uh, once I watched that, I was like, this is it. I'm done. Uh, done for now i'm sure i'll change my mind one of these days but i just love the speed of it i love how easily naturally beautiful it is um and and some say i cheat a little bit too because i i'm never working with something super complex it's just not my style of work you know me i'm very minimal in in my design and and octane actually uh works really extra well with that because it's less likely to crash and less likely to fill up your your graphics card full of geometry so um yeah, I mean that's that's kind of where I ended up with Octane. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, well you've you've done the journey through all three at this point. Yeah, I mean that that's really um, that's really the fun of it is once you 
once you find if you're out there and you're like still on physical first of all you know my heart's with you um but if you haven't tried it don't once you go through that first initial thing of like okay everything's different okay where is everything uh how do i set all this stuff up once you do it once with one renderer it's actually way easier to do the second and third one at least that's what i've found once you understand that this is just going to be a part of your career using different renderers maybe the the a different uh you know, space you work at, maybe a different studio uses a different render, you should really be able to pull the look off you want in multiple renderers. So I would encourage anybody to download these things. There's demos, free trials, all that stuff. Put it on your machine, get dangerous with this stuff because it's just so much clearly uh, faster. And, and I mean, the results speak for themselves. Such a beautiful way to work. So if you haven't taken the dive, do it. Let's go. Yep, yep, yep. Chris, are you Octane? Are you uh, where? Where are you with all this? Yep, still right, still Redshift over here, and uh, enjoying it, learning it more. I mean, you know me; I'm still not rendering. Isn't my primary thing, um, but when I need to, Redshift's been working out pretty well. Awesome. But that's just like I said. I, I'm only using Redshift. Well, not only, but you know, all three are great. Um, but the thing that decided it for me is that Redshift is the one that's closest to vanilla cinema. Not, mm. How am I saying this? I, I want to make like the tutorials I record and whatnot as accessible to as many people as possible. And since Redshift is the one that Maxon, you know, packages up with theirs, then that's the one I'm leaning towards. So, no, I think I think that's smart. I think that's smart. And if you're thinking, which one do I try? Just stop thinking. Pick one that is compatible with your machine. Just start with that. Like I said, get the free trial, get the demo. Um, uh, if you're if you're just learning, I think a lot of these have educational licenses, non-commercial licenses, all that kind of stuff. Just get started with it, and once you see it, you'll be you'll be all in. Um, it, it actually reminded me of the earlier question about uh, discounts and stuff like that. If you are a student, uh, if you uh, and we accept online students as students, if you are learning this Cinema 4D, getting started with all this stuff. Uh, and you want to join Plus, we have a non-commercial license. It's half off. So 50% off. You could join Plus right now, uh, and it's half off for the year. So $199 for the year. You get all this stuff. You get all the tools that the pros use, and you can just start learning from our giant library of training, including Redshift, all that Octane training I mentioned. We got Redshift training, tons of Arnold training as well. So uh, just want to put that out there. If you are a student just getting started, you want a non-commercial license, Hit up the educational page and just fill out the quick form and we'll get you hooked up. Let's see. Well, I think we're pretty much wrapping this up at exactly the perfect time. The correct Chris, time. I'll, I'll come join you in the, in the other uh, in the screen here. Just cu w cut from my screen first and then I'll swipe over and see you on the Skype. And I'll, uh, we could wrap up, maybe answer a couple extra little questions. Oh, let me yeah, know when my the, screen's uh, off. Your screen is off. Yeah, we're, it's oh. the two of us up on screen now. Woohoo! We did so, it, dude. Yeah. As soon as we started chatting, I swapped over here. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, I just wanted to see the chat. Say hi to everybody. Yeah, Scott, totally. Yeah, we here. got lots of people hanging out on YouTube and on Twitch. Thank you, everybody, for coming and hanging out. Um, oh, there's a question. I was kind of waiting for this the whole time. So somebody's saying, if R24 comes out in a month, does that mean that they can no longer use Signal? Uh, no, you're, you're rocking, you're, you're rocking. So, uh, I, I'm assuming you're talking about if you only own signal. So let me start from, from there and I'll graduate all the way up for the different stuff. So if you bought signal as just a separate plugin, uh, any time in its history, uh, you, uh, are rocking on R23 and when R24 or whatever they call it, whatever the next version of cinema 4d comes out, uh, you're, you're good to go. Uh, you can come to your site, come to the new site. We actually have a new page for you. Come download the latest version, fully compatible with R24, and get back to work. Uh, you, no problems there. Now, what you may be talking about is the next version. So 25, R25 will be the last, will, uh, I should say it a different way. R24 will be the last version that we keep compatible with, with our perpetual versions of our plugins. So that means that if you plan on using R24 uh, for the next three years, five years, your version of Signal 
will work on R24, 23, 22, 20, all the way back to what it's supported right now, you are good to go, no problems. The only, um, uh, that that is for perpetual users. If you plan on using Signal or any of our plugins past 24, then plus will have to be the way that you uh, continue forward with Grayscale Gorilla. That is the latest versions. They'll always be up to date with the latest version of Cinema 4D. And more importantly, Cinema 4D changes a lot more fre frequently now than they used to, which means a lot of development work and a lot of stuff on our end to make sure it's fully compatible and you stay fully compatible moving into the future. So just to be clear about your question, uh, Signal and all of our plugins are, are uh, fully compatible through the next version of, uh, of Cinema 4D. And then, uh, like I said, if you wanna stay on 23, 24, 22, we, we're not stopping the uh, use, use or your license to use that stuff. You bought it for these versions, you are good to go. However, if you want to stay up to date with the latest version of Cinema, you need to stay up to date with the latest version of, uh, of Plus, and that's where all the future plugins will always stay up to date with every new version. The M1 chips, people are asking, that's all set, ready to go. If you're using the M1 chips, it's fully compatible with the Plus versions. This is where you're gonna get not only the new versions of Signal and all of our plugins and all of those materials and all that crap that you saw, but also updates and of course anything new that we drop is instantly in your library. So hopefully I answered that specific question. If I didn't, I'm a, I'm asked, happy to dive in. But does I that make think, sense, Chris? I think you got it. I actually just um, just got the uh, GSG Hub the last couple of days, and I, I your guys' downloader and updater is really nice. The uh, everything living in that one single hub, the um, and it's seeing all the different smudges and the materials and the plugins and it, like even the way the interface worked for like downloaded restart cinema like it walked you through very nicely so very nice. I dude that means a lot coming from you man I appreciate that and we've worked really hard and the teams worked really hard to make plus super easy to install everything just like you did um, uh, this week super easy to install everything all in one place always up to date. And same with the materials. If you've used our materials in the past and you've bought them separately, you've most likely gone through the like zip file nightmare, which is like, you know, uncompressing 10 different zips and compiling them together and putting them on one place in your hard drive. Well, it's like seven and gigs or something. It's because the resolution is so high. Yeah. The resolution of these materials are so big and the zip files were out of control. So, you know, part of the big switch to plus was to make all of this stuff easy we don't want you messing with zip files. We want you working and making beautiful stuff for your clients. So we wanted to build this hub so that you click to download. And depending on your internet connection, these are big files, right? But but they download, they install, and you're ready to go. No unzipping, no compiling your own stuff, um, and you're always up to date. So that's actually part of the, the process as well. So same as I said before, if you're looking at it uh, or if you have any questions, hit up support. But it's really something that... Uh, the team has really worked hard on for the last, you know, year and a half or so to build, uh, to build plus. And now officially as of last month, everything that Grayscale Gorilla ever created is inside a plus, including all the plugins, all the materials and all the training. So definitely check it out. If you do this stuff for a living guys, it's a super time saver. Um, thanks for the question too. I appreciate that. Glad we could clear that stuff up. Yeah. Um, yeah, support team. Dean, thank you. I, I mean, I, I try to brag, but our, our, I think we have the best support in our industry. Always on top of it. They're going to answer your questions. If you guys have any questions about this stuff, head up to our support page. They are awesome. They are on top of it. So I appreciate it. Um, anything else, Chris? No, that should wrap this up. I wanted to do quick announcements on my end. Let me make sure I can get this to go. My screen. Um, so quick heads up. I let's see if it actually swaps. Oh, yes, it did. Um, so uh, I updated the schedule for the live stream. So if you head on over to rocketlasso.com, go to the streaming page. Uh, we've got some more guests coming up. I've got smear balls coming up in two weeks, which should be hey, really it's good. It's Nick. Nick again. I love Another that guy. Nick. Yep. Uh, Rick Barrett will be joining me the week I after. I love that guy. Casey Hupke after that. I love that guy. We got Nose Man. And then we nah, finally. He's, a, he's okay. No, I'm just kidding. I love you too, <laughs> I love you too Nose Man. Good. I love that guy. Uh, then we you have one, 
one regular week, and we got Jess Herrera on, which I'm looking Dude, forward to. Jess. We'll be talking character stuff. Uh, Jess is awesome. If you haven't checked out Jess's work, she she does incredible work. I even set links up here so you can click on her name. It'll go right to her website. So go check out her work. Um, so, yeah, go ahead on over to, yeah, see? Adorable dinosaurs. Look at that. So I'll put a link to this in the chat. But, yeah, definitely go and check out the schedule so you can see what is upcoming on uh, the live streams. So it's going to be busy in the next couple of months, but I hope that I'll be able to do a regular rotation of guests. The plan is every other week, but I just happened to <laughs> everything got crammed together. So that's a, a temporary thing. But now we've also broken the seal here with Nick being a guest. So good chance we might get him on again sometime. Maybe Chad might join us. Some people in the chat were asking if we could get a three way chat or a three way broadcast going, getting Chad in here as well. That might be challenging to get the, the structure going with how much difficulty we had today getting he's going we, bar- we barely got pretty this cool. one rolling yeah uh, uh um, hey but before you wrap it all up i uh, uh, i just want to appreciate you bringing me on chris this is awesome always love and beautiful stuff uh with you it's always fun man i appreciate yeah, that likewise it's been too long good to see took, you guys took a while to line this up so yeah it's great thank you guys in the uh chat here as well for the the good questions appreciate you love right. cinema love playing in this stuff all right well Thanks, everybody, for coming and hanging out with us. Um, if you, like I said, if you follow on Patreon, you get access to all these scene files and early access to different replays. There's a really cool tutorial I just posted on Patreon yesterday. It'll be public in a week. It's all about this peeling paper off of a wall for, like, spooky wallpaper or revealing a poster. I think it's pretty cool. But that's going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody, on Twitch for asking great questions. Everybody on YouTube for asking more great questions. I'll see you in the next tutorial, or I'll see you in the next live stream. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys.